how do British people feel about eye contact? Where do Japanese people look when they are meeting someone for the first time? What is the Russian approach to smiling? Hello there, my name is Dylan and welcome to another British English listening exercise. Today I'll be reading you a very interesting article exploring the differences in cultural behaviour, specifically in the workplace. I will then be providing you with some insider British knowledge, which will help you make a great first impression. We will explore the correct way to introduce yourself, whether or not smiling makes you look like an idiot, if it's dangerous to hold eye contact in certain parts of the world, and much more. Enjoy. Cultural Behaviour in Business Much of today's business is conducted across international borders, and while the majority of the global business community might share the use of English as a common language, the nuances and expectations of business communication might differ greatly from culture to culture. A lack of understanding of the cultural norms and practices of our business acquaintances can result in unfair judgments, misunderstandings and breakdowns in communication. Here are three basic areas of differences in the business etiquette around the world that can help you stand in good stead when you next find yourself working with someone from a different culture. Addressing someone When discussing this topic in a training course, a German trainee and a British trainee got into a hot debate about whether it was appropriate for someone with a doctorate to use the corresponding title on their business card. The British trainee maintained that anyone who wasn't a medical doctor expecting to be addressed as doctor was disgustingly pompous and full of themselves. The German trainee, however, argued that the hard work and years of education put into earning that PhD should give them full rights to expect to be addressed as doctor. This stark difference in opinion over something that could be conceived as minor and thus easily overlooked goes to show that we often attach meaning to even the most mundane practices. When things that we are used to are done differently, it could spark the strongest reaction in us. While many continental Europeans and Latin Americans prefer to be addressed with a title, for example Mr or Ms, and their surname when meeting someone in a business context for the first time, Americans, and increasingly the British, now tend to prefer using their first names. The best thing to do is to listen and observe how your conversation partner addresses you and, if you are still unsure, do not be afraid to ask them how they would like to be addressed. Right, guys, the first point we are going to explore is the correct way to address someone. So, in the text, there's a disagreement between a German and a British trainee regarding the use of the title doctor for someone with a non-medical doctorate on their business card. So a doctorate is the highest form of degree that one can obtain. So you may have heard of a PhD. Um, for example, this is a type of doctorate degree. So the question is, can someone who has earned a PhD, have they also earned the right to call themselves a doctor? The British trainee sees it as pompous, whilst the German trainee argues that the hard work and education behind obtaining a PhD 
justifies using the title. Pompous is an adjective used to describe someone or something that displays an exaggerated sense of self-importance. So basically, someone who thinks they are a lot more important or impressive than they actually are. So I think the argument from the British person is that they are... They're ranking a medical doctor above a more academic doctor, which I guess would describe someone with a, a doctorate degree. And they're therefore saying that someone who has earned that PhD um, by claiming they're on the same level as the medical profession, they're kind of making themselves out to be better than they actually are. Regarding the matter of people with PhDs calling themselves doctors, personally, I don't really mind. <laughs> I know, it's a great opinion. But if a doctorate wants to call themselves Dr. Smith, let them do it. In my opinion, they are technically a doctor, just not the type that most people think of, which would be a medical doctor. It's up to them if they feel the need to do that. And I guess they have earned that right. A PhD is a lot of work and it does deserve some respect. A lot of respect, actually, because you have to be smart and extremely determined um, to earn a PhD. However, I do have the utmost respect for medical doctors as well. But, you know, I think, I don't think it's that big a deal personally. I think the majority of people don't really care that much whether or not someone who is technically a doctor, whether they're putting doctor on their business card, like, doesn't really matter that much. So speaking of respect, uh, I have a point I wanted to discuss that I thought was quite relevant. Um, on another note, respect is of course very important in all areas of life, but in the UK, maybe in the West in general, age-based seniority is a lot less recognised than in Eastern society. Dare I say that beyond basic social etiquette, such as giving up your seat for a cronky old lady on the bus... <laughs> It doesn't really exist in the UK. And I know this is a stark difference to places in the East, such as um, Korea or Japan, where they're very conscious about that type of thing, which I think is both good and bad. So in the East, right, I know that there is a big aspect on if someone is older than you, you will likely have to address them as Mr. or Mrs. And you will have to be a lot more obedient than you may otherwise have had to be if they were the same age as you or of course even younger I know there are different you have to there's a different type of word there's a different ending to the words in certain languages which you have to use if someone is older than you as mentioned I think that showing respect in general is very important however I personally think that just because someone is older than you doesn't automatically mean that they deserve more respect than someone of your age or possibly even younger. And this is definitely a Western mindset. So yeah, I, I know that could be a shock to some of you watching this, but as mentioned in the UK, this age-based seniority thing, it certainly isn't as important as it is in other countries. That being said, you should of course be helping elderly people when they need it, giving up your seat, helping them reach the toilet roll on the top shelf, helping them cross the road, that type of thing. I did that the other day. I was in a supermarket. Some old man was trying to reach up. He didn't even have to ask. I just did it for him. Got him a nice box of tissues. He said thank you. And yeah, I felt good. <laughs> so basic social manners and etiquette are very important. Etiquette, put very simply, is the socially acceptable way to act. Another difference mentioned in the text is how some people prefer titles like Mr. or Mrs. whilst others, like Americans and increasingly the British, prefer using first names. This is extremely true. This is extremely true. Personally, unless told otherwise, I would prefer to call someone by their first name because I think it creates a more personal and equal 
relationship with that person. And in the UK, it's certainly a more, lot more common to call someone by their first name, especially in more casual relationships. But that being said, this does go for the workplace as well. I think you would have to be in quite a strict, regulated job to call your colleagues anything but their first name. And like nicknames are really big here as well. So if someone's called like Mr. Smith, don't be surprised if they're referred to as like Smithy or something like that. <laughs> so say if you're meeting your friend's uh, parents or your partner's parents for the first time unless told otherwise you are very you're most likely going to call them by their first name in the UK right and I know this may sound unusual or disrespectful to a lot of people watching this and perhaps this has resulted in a situation where they have visited the UK and they're not addressed the way that they are used to in the country that they're from and this might startle them they might uh, hopefully they don't feel offended because they sh they they shouldn't need to this is not us trying to like offend other people it's just the it's just the culture that we have been brought up on and i think that is the most important thing about this text and of course about just this topic in general it's not just knowing what the cultural differences are so that you are able to use them it's having an understanding of what they are. So if someone from another country addresses you by your first name, or as we'll get on, as we'll discover later in the text, um, is staring at you or is smiling at you, you will know not to be offended because they're not meaning any offense. It's simply just the way in which they operate and it's normal to them. So I think that's why it's important to have an understanding of the different cultures from people around the world. As the text mentions, and this is golden, this is all you really need to know. The best thing to do is to listen and observe how your conversation partner addresses you. And if you are still unsure, do not be afraid to ask them how they would like to be addressed. And not only how they address you, but how they introduce themselves. To be honest, I think if someone said, hi, my name is Jack Johnson, <laughs> I think it's fair game to call them Jack. Or if they said, hi, my name is Mr. Johnson, that would mean that they would like to be addressed with their, their surname as well. Smiling. A so-called smile of respect is seen as insincere and often regarded with suspicion in Russia. A famous Russian proverb even states that laughing without reason is a sign of idiocy. Yet, in countries like the United States, Australia and Britain, smiling is often interpreted as a sign of openness, friendship and respect, and is frequently used to break the ice. In a piece of research done on smiles across cultures, the researchers found that smiling individuals were considered more intelligent than non-smiling people in countries such as Germany, Switzerland, China and Malaysia. However, in countries like Russia, Japan, South Korea and Iran, Pictures of smiling faces were rated as less intelligent than the non-smiling ones. Meanwhile, in countries like India, Argentina and the Maldives, smiling was associated with dishonesty. Smiling, a very important topic. So, the text highlights cultural differences in the interpretation of smiles. According to the text, all right, according to the text, in Russia, a smile of respect is viewed as insincere and met with suspicion, reflecting a cultural belief captured in a proverb that associates laughing without reason with idiocy. So idiocy means stupidity. You are probably familiar with this word idiot. If someone's an idiot, it means they are stupid. Right, laughing without reason is a sign of idiocy. 
Yeah, I agree. I think that's universally recognized, not just a Russian thing. So you might be thinking, why have they felt the need to include the fact that it's a Russian um, proverb when this is probably like just common knowledge? You know, if someone randomly burst out laughing, you would probably look at them like they're a bit odd and potentially, as the text suggests, a bit of an idiot. Right, I've got some insider information on this one. You know, the text originally said that the Russian expression was that smiling without reason is a, is a sign of idiocy, which I think is a lot more notable than laughing without reason. I think it's absolutely fine to smile without reason. But correct me if I'm wrong, Russian people watching this, but I believe the proverb is laughing without reason, which is completely fine. That's not like particularly, you know, significant. I think most people will agree that is the case. I just wanted to give some context. Right. However, in the United States, Australia and Britain, smiling is seen as a positive gesture signifying openness, friendship and respect often used for social engagement. This is absolutely factual. The research mentioned in the text reveals varying perceptions of intelligence associated with smiling across different cultures. In Germany, Switzerland, China and Malaysia, smiling individuals are considered more intelligent, whilst in Russia, Japan, South Korea and Iran, smiling faces are rated as less intelligent than the non-smiling ones. I'm interested to see if this is true. So if you are from those places, please do comment and let me know because it's a bit odd because they're not these countries. You would think that countries that share cultural beliefs are probably going to be um, bunched together. And that isn't really the case. For example, Germany isn't particularly close to China and Malaysia. Of course, these are these two are right next to each other. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. I wouldn't really say that the countries bunched up here and here all share that, of course some of them do, but share that many cultural beliefs. So if this is the case, it's interesting to see why certain countries around the world, dotted around the world, do share this cultural idea that if you smile, you're not as intelligent as smiling people. And another note as well I wanted to bring up to do with this whole article. I strongly believe i i've got a hunch i've got an idea that basically what is being said here for the most part is not a hundred percent factual it's not a hundred percent fiction i think it's kind of true and i also think that the that a lot of what is being said here is true in older generations and not so much in the younger generations as well because i find that when you hear about these different countries' cultures, normally the more shocking or stark differences are within the older generations. But as the world has become more connected with each other, we have sort of become a bit more similar. So the, the cultural differences aren't as stark as they used to be. So that that's what I that's the impression I'm getting. And if I were to guess, if I were to bet, I'd say that that is true for the majority of the content from today's article. Right, additionally, in countries like India, Argentina and the Maldives, smiling is linked to dishonesty. Apparently. <laughs> Very interesting. If you see your country pop up in today's video, let me know if what I'm saying is true or not, as I'm unsure on the validity of this text. Validity is how valid something is, and if something is valid, it means it's true, uh, relevant, legit, that type of thing. Is this straight? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, right, yeah. So I'm unsure on the validity of this text. So I got this from the British Council website. I have no reason to believe that it isn't factual. However, it isn't a peer-reviewed scientific insight into how business is conducted overseas. It's just an article. So as mentioned, I reckon it's going to be partly true, partly false. If I say your country does this or your country does that and it isn't the case, 
do if you feel the need to correct me please do so i encourage you to do that because I, I would like to know the truth to be honest Right, for me, smiling is important. I don't think I smile enough. It might be a British thing. You see American presenters and YouTubers, they tend to be, they tend to normally be more upbeat and energetic, like, hey dudes, how's it going? This is American Education. We have an awesome video for you guys. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell. Whereas British people tend to be a bit more mellow, a bit more boring, you know, like, hi guys. Welcome to another video. This is British education. You need to look at my older videos. Honestly, it's like, <laughs> I'm so, my expression is just like, hi guys, welcome to British education. We have another video today. <laughs> just, of course, that's part of like being on camera for the first time. It's, you know, you're a bit nervous or whatever. But I also think that's quite a British thing, just to be a bit less energetic, more calm. Um, and I think you can tell this with other British YouTubers and British television as well, compared to American television, for example. The presenters in the US are so much more energetic. They're always trying to make a really big show of it. Whereas in Britain, it's a lot more subtle, a lot more relaxed, that type of thing. I personally think a genuine smile is always a good thing. Yep. And it certainly makes someone more approachable and in turn builds a more trustworthy relationship if the smile was genuine, which is sometimes hard to tell. There has also been a lot of research that suggests that when you smile, you feel more happy just from smiling, even if it's a forced smile. So I think certainly smiling is a good thing. As obvious as it sounds, I think it comes down to the country's core beliefs about how business should be conducted. You could argue that in the workplace you may slightly fear someone and in turn want to obey them if they don't smile, but I'm not sure what type of relationship that builds. Let me explain. So say if you have a boss and he or she is never smiles at you, they always look at you quite seriously. You're probably going to be a bit intimidated, right? So when they ask you to do something, you're going to do it because you don't want to, you know, upset someone that you are scared of. On the other hand, if you have a boss who is always smiling at you, you're going to like them more. And then when they ask you to do something, you're going to do it because you want to please them, but not because you're scared of them, because you want to make them happy. So what type of relationship... Does both of these do both of these uh, approaches build? For me, the angry one, the scary one, whilst it is definitely effective in the short term, I think in the long run, you know, a relationship built on fear, especially in business, is not going to work out very well. Well, in all aspects of life, it's not going to work out well, is it? However, if someone is smiling at you and you actually like them and you want to work with them, that builds a positive relationship. So you could argue it's however the whatever the country's core beliefs about how business should be conducted are. That's the approach they're going to have. As obvious as that sounds, like culture comes from the, the country's core beliefs. <laughs> right, so in Britain, crack a smile. We need it. We need it, guys. The weather is abysmal here. A smile does not go amiss in the UK. <laughs> And we will like you more for it, which sounds pretty obvious as I'm saying it. Um, but obviously, you don't have to smile at people you don't like if you don't want to. Eye contact. An American or British person might be looking their client in the eye to show they are paying full attention to what is being said. But... If that client is from Japan or Korea, they might find the direct eye contact awkward or even disrespectful. In parts of South America and Africa, prolonged eye contact could also be seen as challenging authority. In the Middle East, eye contact across genders is considered inappropriate, although 
eye contact within a gender could signify honesty and truthfulness. Having an increased awareness of the possible differences in expectations and behaviour can help us avoid cases of miscommunication, but it is vital that we also remember that cultural stereotypes can be detrimental to building good business relationships. Although national cultures could play a part in shaping the way we behave and think, we are also largely influenced by the region we come from, the communities we associate with, our age and gender, our corporate culture and our individual experiences of the world. The knowledge of the potential differences should therefore be something we keep at the back of our minds, rather than something that we use to pigeonhole the individuals of an entire nation. Okay, last but definitely not least, we have eye contact. Right, the text discusses cultural variations in the interpretation of eye contact and emphasises the importance of understanding and respecting these differences. For instance, whilst Americans or Brits may maintain direct eye contact to convey attentiveness, individuals from Japan or Korea may perceive such eye contact as uncomfortable or disrespectful. Now, I didn't know this until I read this article, so I kind of hope this isn't true because I've visited those places and, you know, I I was looking people in their eyes, <laughs> you know, and I didn't want to, I, I hope I didn't disrespect anyone. I feel as if I didn't. And once again, maybe like the older generations, if I were to do that to them, they might feel disrespected. However, I'm sure that they realize that I'm, you know, a young, ignorant Westerner from England. So you do get that card where you can get away with, um, get away with stuff like that, which to you is just like normal, for example. In certain regions of South America and Africa, prolonged eye contact could be construed as a challenge to authority. So prolonged means extended in duration or time, often longer than, than what would be normally expected. And construed is how something is interpreted or understood, how they take it, pretty much. In the Middle East, eye contact between genders is often deemed inappropriate, although within the same gender, it may signify honesty. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true or not. Please, please do let me know if it is true. I'm aware that it might be considered rude or maybe aggressive to maintain eye contact in certain countries, but respectfully, if we are having a conversation, I think that eye contact is important and nice as well. We're all humans, right? Let's just cut these rules and look each other in the eyes as we talk. Right, as I'm saying that, I know how self-righteous that sounds. Like, oh, we're all humans, man. Let's just let's just cut these silly rules, man. But it's true. It is true. That's my. That's how I feel about it. You can understand so much from someone's eyes. It's the window to their soul. I think people say that. I'm pretty sure they do. Plus, like, where else are you actually going to look? Seriously, that's not a rhetorical question. If you are meeting someone for the first time, you go to shake their hand. Let's say you are in a country where potentially it's not encouraged to stare at someone for too long. How long is too long? Do we have five seconds of allotted eye contact time before it starts becoming rude or before you're challenging them to a, a dance off or something like that? And then once that time is over, where are you supposed to look? Do you immediately go to their shoes their hair, their ear, you know. That's not a rhetorical question. I would genuinely like to know that. By the way, a rhetorical question is one which isn't actually um, expecting... Sorry, it's when you ask a question and you're not expecting an answer to the question. 
the question is just used to make a statement. For example, say if you do something a bit naughty when you were younger, your mum or your dad might say to you, what are you doing? Do you know how dangerous that was? Do you know how stupid that was? They're not actually expecting you to be like, yeah, no, that was pretty dangerous to be fair or it has that was quite stupid. They're just saying it to, to make a point. The text suggests that being aware of these potential differences in expectations and behaviour can help prevent miscommunication. However, it also cautions against relying on cultural stereotypes as these can be detrimental to building effective business relationships. Don't rely on this text as I'm unsure on the validity. (laughs) Although, uh, do let me know. Give me the inside scoop if, you know, I've said this a million times, but I am interested. So let me know if I've said your country does this and it is or isn't the case. Right, detrimental, this means dangerous or damaging. So, for example, um, relying on these cultural stereotypes, if it's detrimental to building an effective business relationship, it means that it is damaging to it. So it's not going to build it. It's actually going to cause um, the the relationship to break down. I feel like I've explained that really poorly, but yeah, sorry. All right, as, if your country has been mentioned, please comment down below. Let me know whether the information is true, false, kind of true. I guess those are your three options. As mentioned, I'm pretty sure it's going to be this one mixed with a bit of, yeah, more true in the older generations. If your country hasn't been mentioned, feel free to let me know any cultural differences that you may have, please. Right, how to make a good first impression, in my humble opinion. This is hardly groundbreaking stuff. This is fairly common knowledge, but I thought it was worth saying. So stand up straight. Maintain eye contact, smile, listen to how they introduce themselves and mimic them. The way they introduce themselves will normally be their first name. If in doubt, ask. And if unsure, a great question to ask is, you know, is how would you like me to address you? So in the UK, if you do these four things, you are bound to make a good first impression. That is the correct way to approach your your posture, your eye contact, the way that you, you look at them, if you smile, and the way you speak to them as well. I think that in the UK and in the West in general, in my opinion, I think, if I'm honest, I think that we could, because other countries, right, they have to learn English or they would certainly feel obliged to learn English in order to sort of, because it's very commonly spoken language, it gives you access to the UK, America, Australia. So it's important for them to speak it. So in turn, that means that a lot of people from different countries are kind of forced to learn English, and therefore they have to take more of an interest in the English and American, Australian, the Western culture of the world. So they are more aware of the cultural differences than we are. So in turn, we are maybe, not on purpose, but we probably are less informed, dare I say less interested, in how other countries should behave. We would probably presume that our way of life is the same as everywhere else in the world i don't want to speak on behalf of my whole country but that's just my opinion and i think certainly the part about them about us not having to learn a second language whereas people from around the world you know you guys watching this you're watching this maybe because you're you want to learn english and maybe i think a lot of you might be watching this because you feel the need to learn it in order to live a more fulfilled life So I think the point I'm trying to make, I'm rambling a bit right now, but basically do not be offended if someone from the UK approaches you with their cultural beliefs and does these four things, for example, and just take it with a pinch of salt with the knowledge that we um, unfortunately are just less, well, if I'm honest, less in touch with the other countries' cultures, okay? 
So that's my next point. Don't feel offended if someone does these things to you. So when they meet you, if they are looking you in the eye, if they're smiling, if they're calling you by your first name, I know that'll probably be quite a big one. It's just the way in which English American people think is the correct way to act. Okay, so obviously they're not trying to offend you. Right, and that's the video, guys. That's the video. I do have a little section here. My new setup. Well, the setup I'm using for this particular video. Full credit goes to Luke's English podcast. I think his videos are brilliant. However, I'm genuinely not trying to copy his content. This is just such an efficient way of filming these longer style videos. It means I don't have to spend days trying to memorize long scripts. I can be more precise with my words. And most importantly, it really helps me to teach you more effectively. To put it bluntly, filming videos like this would be a pain in the ass without this setup. A pain in the ass is a common expression used when something is hard or tedious. It's very informal, but it's not really a swear word. So you can say this to your colleagues, your peers, may I add, not your bosses, but you know, and your friends and maybe family as well. Yeah. So honestly, can you imagine me trying to film this video without this without this script next to me? It would be extremely hard. Some people are very good at just sitting down and talking to a camera for like an hour straight. Fair play to them. However, for me, these longer style videos would be near impossible without something like this, unless I spent days memorizing the script, which is what I was doing before. Okay. So I'd like to give full credit and a great deal of respect to Luke for his channel and also for this style. And I really hope it isn't a big deal that I'm using it for this particular video. I'm sure you know his channel, but if for some reason you don't, perhaps you have been living under a rock for the last couple of years, definitely go and check out his videos. They are brilliant. Final thing I'm going to teach you today is this expression living under a rock <laughs> so if you might hear someone say to you have you been living under a rock for the last couple of years what it means is if you're living under a rock then you're not going to be aware of the world around you you're not going to be aware of what is popular and what is common in the world think literally if you are living under a rock you're not going to know what's going on right so it's kind of like a light-hearted expression, but now you know what it means. Right, guys, I will see you at the outro. Right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I certainly did. If you would like to read today's text, it is available on the British Council website. I will leave a link in the description. If you did enjoy today's video, why not consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even commenting down below. It does make a very big difference and it is massively appreciated. Right guys, thank you again for watching and until next time, cheers.